You're listening to a sermon preached at Grace Church of Orange, California. For more info about Grace, please go to www.graceorange.org. And now, join us as we go verse by verse through God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. Well, it's really good to be back with you today. This is my first Sunday with you in 2019. And uh, the week after Christmas, I took some time just to be with the family. But then this past week, I had the privilege of being a part of a preaching class, actually, at the Master's Seminary, where all of our young guys go, Andrew and Winston and Connor and and even Michael, who's out in, in Rancho now. But there were about 40 pastors from around the country and really around the world. There were guys from Arizona and Pennsylvania and Texas and Oklahoma and Florida, but there were also pastors from uh, Canada, Malawi, Vietnam, Israel. And it was good to be uh, with fellow preachers that are committed to what we're committed to here at Grace, Uh, expository preaching of the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, the the authoritative Word of God and the, the sufficient Word of God, and then living it out, not just knowing it, but doing it. And I'm reminded of 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that speaks of the word of God that does its work in us who believe. And so uh, that happens through every part of life. In joy, in in sorrow, in pleasure, in pain, in in grief. And today we're going to look in Romans 9, 1 through 5, we're going to see Paul's unceasing grief over unbelief unceasing grief over unbelief. Now, grief is usually something we experience when someone dies. When we lose a loved one, when it's sadness and tears and maybe a relationship is broken or taken away, but it's a strong emotion, grief. It's often accompanied by those tears and that deep sadness. What we're going to see today is the unceasing grief that Paul had because that his own people were rejecting Christ is the very real burden of a person who is burdened for the lost. It's, it's loving concern for people's souls. So I want you to open your Bibles up to Romans chapter 9 and stand, if you're able, for the reading of the Word of God. And let me remind you, this is the Word of God. It's the only perfect part of the worship service. Read Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. We're going to look at the first three verses today, but we're going to read all five. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are the Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts today, that you would open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things in your word, and that above all, we would see the glory of Christ, all for your glory, and we pray in Christ's name, amen. So I don't think I've ever told you this before, but Romans chapter 9 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Now Romans chapter 8 is awesome. Okay, we spent a lot of time in Romans chapter 8. It's awesome and it's amazing, but Romans 9 is one of my favorite chapters. Uh, There's a temptation, actually, when you're going through Romans, to climb the mountaintop in Romans 8 and be on this peak and kind of look across the peaks and go, hey, Romans 12 is out there. Let's just leap over there. Let's forget about Romans 9, 10, and 11. Let's just go into Romans 12. I mean, it it looks so inviting. It looks so applicable to daily life. Why not skip chapters 9 through 11 and just go to Romans 12? I mean, we've been swimming in some deep theological waters. We need a break. We, we fight the, why would we want to fight the strong current of the, of the sovereignty of God and salvation when we could settle down and get more practical? And it's very easy for us to think this way. 
But if you skip the density and the determination of God and the deep things of God in Romans chapters 9 through 11, you don't have the gospel message in all its fullness. This explains, these these three chapters are going to explain God's behind-the-scenes knowledge and workings. And so it is good for us to to take what's next in Romans, to receive these truths, and to live them where the rubber meets the road in daily life. It really is. It's good for us. But it's just true that a lot of people don't see the connection between Romans 9 through 11 and chapters 1 to 8, or even 12 to 16 for that matter. Romans 1 to 8 are about how God makes people righteous in Christ and how he works in and for those he makes righteous. Chapters 12 through 16 is how the righteous live. So in between, you've got three confusing chapters. They're confusing. You know, it's easy to ask, why are they in Romans? Why are they here? Think about it. Here on the threshold of Romans chapter 9, Paul is still on the mountaintop of Romans chapter 8. This is why I had our, our youth and our anchored students recite the whole chapter again today. They got the word in them. But I want you to not forget that this connects, that this jives, that this gels, that this is seamless, that we can't ignore it. It's because here, in these three chapters, you have the doctrines of God's sovereignty and election, bedrock of the gospel, what happens under God's direction, and how we are responsible for every choice we make. Here you have Romans chapter 8. It ends on this huge high point of assurance and confidence. You just want to shout. Here is God guaranteeing our final perseverance because our salvation isn't based on our work and our strength. God called us. God opens our heart to the gospel. God will carry us to final glory. These are glorious truths. The golden chain of salvation. Romans 8, 29 and 30, the ordo salutis, the order of salvation, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. But it begs the question, what about the Jews? Are they excluded? God called them, God came to them, but most rejected Christ. So is there any hope for the Jews? I want you to remember what Paul said about the gospel in chapter 1, verse 16, that it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Anyone getting saved is going to get saved by Christ alone. God is a saving God. But Romans 9 through 11 takes us into the deep end of the pool regarding who God is and how he works. God's sovereign grace and mercy, his determination of salvation. It's been said that Romans 8 brings heaven to our doorstep. And that when you get to Romans 9, all heaven and hell break loose. Because some can't get enough of it, and some can't stand it. But what it does is it tells us God has this salvation thing wired. He's got it all under control. And some of us want to trust our own minds more than God. We haven't yet become humble enough to admit that God is God. People will tell you as as the day is long that you decide it all. Van Moody in his book, The I Factor, says that it's about how building a better relationship with yourself is the key to everything. He actually refers to the Bible and God, but the book places higher value and higher um, weight on you rather than God. How you are in control, not God. Van Moody says, knowing yourself, not knowing God, is key. Run from people like Van Moody. Listen to God and his word instead. But I come to Romans 9 with joy. With joy and with caution. With joy because I know what's in there but also caution because many don't want it to say what it says. God's word stands, and it is best taken at full strength, undiluted. It is good for our souls. Don't water it down. 
Take God's word as it stands. You see, Romans chapters 9 through 11 should come with a warning sign. Don't avoid it. It's good for your soul. You should have to sign a disclaimer before you read it. Yes, I will believe everything God says. And I want you to remember something as we, as we really dive into these three chapters. I don't want you to think that taking a high view of doctrine pulls you away from a heart for the lost. High thinking of doctrine does not pull you away from a heart for the lost because that would be missing the point of great doctrine. It should spur you on to more evangelism and more discipleship. The highest view of the doctrine of election in Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 9 should lead to more fervent evangelism, not less. And so we're going to unpack this more as we move through Romans 9. Why the doctrines of grace give you more zeal for evangelism. Why it is a joy to do it when you know God is sovereign. How the pressure is off us that we just, we don't have to be so clever. We just deliver the simple gospel message. Now, Romans 9 starts with a heartfelt confession. I love this. This is what we're going to focus on today. And by the way, the deeper questions of God's sovereignty and election are yet to come. Today, we're going to focus on Paul's heart for the lost. Paul was writing to the church in Rome around 57 AD during his third missionary journey, probably from Corinth, Greece. Romans 15, 19 to 23 says that he preached the gospel from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, which is modern day Albania. So on his his three missionary journeys that are recorded in the book of Acts, he planted churches in what is now modern day Turkey and Greece and Macedonia. Now he would have had at this point about 25 years of pastoral experience. And here you see the heart of a pastor. He knows how doctrine is applied by preaching to change lives and churches. And he is writing to a church made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. Young Christians that he hadn't met personally, but he knew what they needed most was the gospel. And they didn't just need to know the gospel, they needed to love the gospel and live it. And what we see here is Paul's great passion. We're going to look at the first three verses. Paul's great passion. This is very important for us to grasp, especially because we're at the very beginning of Romans 9. See, Paul is on the top of the mountain in Romans 8, and his mind is on a problem back home. He was thinking of those who were missing out on the blessings of Christ, and for good reason. His people were outside of Christ, without hope, without God, even though they thought they were the ones closest to God. They thought they had a handle on the truth. They thought they had a corner on the market on God. They thought they had it wired. So knowing that, Paul breaks down and bears all. He bears his soul to us. He he bears his heart. And he begins to speak of his kinsmen. Look with me at verse 1. He begins, I am speaking the truth. In Christ, I am not lying. His opponents would accuse him of hating Jews now that he was a Christian. He did not stop being a Jew and he did not stop loving his people. The word truth comes first in this verse, shows the primacy of truth. It's about the truth in Christ, the Messiah. He says, I'm not lying. He uses a phrase like this whenever he's under attack by his opponents. You see an example in 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 30, he says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. He says, my conscience bears me witness. Conscience literally means with knowledge. It's it's how you know yourself. The instinctive sense of right and wrong that you have that produces guilt when violated. It's like God has put a warning system in all people that activates when we choose to ignore or disobey him. He says, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now, your conscience is not infallible. Our consciences sometimes aren't correct. 
They don't always judge things rightly. But Paul's conscience is under the power of the Holy Spirit. He was being true. What this tells us is he wasn't just having a natural love for his people. This isn't national pride here. This is gospel love for people outside of Christ. Because evangelism is a matter of love. Love for Jesus, love for others, and then giving them the gospel because you love them so much. Paul says, I tell the truth. I, I lie not. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. So he calls two witnesses to testify to the truth of what he is saying. His conscience giving supporting evidence that testifies in support of him. Verse 2, he says, I have great sorrow. This is the point. He says, I have great sorrow. And great sorrow is the first word in that Greek sentence. It's an emphasis on sadness. It's an emphasis on distress. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. That's grief. That's heaviness. It's continual. It's unceasing. It's constant. It's unrelenting. It's unstopping. It's intense anxiety. And it's in his heart. It's in his inner self. It's his mind. His grief over the spiritual condition of Israel was like the Old Testament prophets. They lamented the sin and the resulting judgment of God on the people of Israel. Jeremiah 4 says this, Oh, my anguish, my anguish. I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart. My heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent. My people are fools. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They do not know how to do good. And just like the prophets that were lamenting Israel's unfaithfulness, Paul is lamenting Israel's unbelief. Then he says something shocking. Shocking. Look at verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed. That's the Greek word anathema. That's, that, that's about someone who is rejected and denied status. That's someone who is set apart for destruction in eternal hell. Actually, it's someone who's set apart by God for destruction in eternal hell. In the Bible, the, cities of Jer- the city of Jericho and the Canaanite cities that were conquered by Israel were said to be anathema. He says, I, I could wish that I were or cursed and cut off from Christ. Done away with for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. This is like Moses when Israel worshiped the golden calf. Moses asked that God would blot his name out of the book if he would not forgive his people. Exodus 32. Paul is willing to sacrifice his salvation for the sake of Israel. This is a deep expression of his love for his brethren, his fellow countrymen, a race, a nation, a body of people, ethnic Israel, a lost race, a lost nation, a lost body of people. And Paul is saying, I would substitute myself for them. I would do it in a heartbeat. I would give up all I have if they would be saved. This is Christ-like love. And he is expressing grief in his heart over his people. It's a shocking statement he makes. They are, they are so much on his mind that he's at the top of the mountain on Romans 8. And no sooner does he pen the words, in Jesus Christ our Lord, that he is thinking of Israel, who is rejecting Christ. They were so much on his mind. They rejected the very Christ who offers and provides so great a salvation. Now what Paul said couldn't happen. You know how we say things sometimes when we're in distress and we say something that is just so outlandish and you're like, that couldn't happen? This is like that. Paul knew that it was impossible. He had just said, Romans 8, 38 and 39, nothing could separate him from the love of God in Christ. Nothing. 
Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Paul is saying that humanly speaking, I'm willing to trade my salvation for theirs. He could not, but he felt like that. I love the honesty. I love the love. This is how he felt. This is how he felt. And his deep grief over his people's unbelief. Some of whom wanted to kill him. Did you notice the huge mood swing? From those of you that are you know, prone to mood swings, from the pinnacle of joy over salvation in chapter 8 to the depths of despair over Israel's unbelief in chapter 9. You go back into Romans 8, verse 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The love of Christ demonstrated on the cross. Greatest act of love ever. When Jesus died on the cross, affects our eternity. We read in Romans 8 that no, no one can bring a charge against God's elect that would threaten their security in what Jesus has done for them. Whatever happens works together for our good, the good that only God can see. He conforms us into the image of Christ. And then you get to those last two verses in Romans 8, 38 and 39. I'm convinced neither death, life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, other, anything else created shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he knows what he says could not happen. But he goes from the pinnacle of joy over what God has done for us in Christ to the despair of soul over those rejecting Christ. This shows gospel love. This shows the kind of love that God puts in our hearts. At the same time we're experiencing joy over our salvation, we have grief over unbelief. Paul was a converted Jew. He understood what the Old Testament was saying all along. He knows that the only way that his Jewish brethren can ever be justified by faith is through Jesus Christ and him alone. So when he thinks of Israel, he goes from joy to sorrow as he realizes they're blinded. They're blinded. They cannot see that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that they were looking for for so long. Next week, we'll look at all the privileges they were given to point them to Christ. And Israel's exclusion from Christ is surprising. Their estrangement from Jesus doesn't make sense. How could people, given God's covenantal promises, not be part of the new community that he has formed? Why did so many Jews refuse to believe? So an outsider looking in would be puzzled. But there is hope for Israel in Romans 9 to 11. God is not through with Israel. But what we see here is the heart God puts in the redeemed for the lost. The, God, the heart God puts in you for the lost. And as we see that, as we see that heart that God gives us, you also see the character and attributes of God. You see the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the sovereignty of God. And you see Paul's great passion reflecting the heart of God. Even for a group that hates him and wants to kill him and hates what he stands for. Just like he did with Stephen. You see the heart of Paul in Romans 9. This is, this is awesome for us to start here. This is in the wisdom of God, he puts this heart at the very beginning of Romans 9, right before we dive deep into the depths of God's sovereignty in salvation. Here we see the breaking heart of a lover of people, God-given compassion, the depths of a heart burdened by the lostness of people. You know how it is, often when you're experiencing something, enjoying a beautiful blessing, you often think of those who are missing out. In Romans 8, God, God had had Paul celebrating the gospel that leaves us uncondemned and unseparated from him. And as he's writing it, 
he's starting to think about those that are condemned and that are separated from him. Pens the words, Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his mind goes to those who are condemned and separated. His heart is filled with pain. His heart is filled with anguish. He is willing to be cursed for his people because his brothers and sisters from Israel are separated from Christ. What would be the equivalent for us today? Maybe unbelievers in the professing church? Maybe classmates, workmates, neighbors, family members? It really depends on your background. I grew up in the liberal Protestant church. So I have a burden for people in churches that are denying the authority of scripture and denying the deity of Christ and things like that. The denying the true gospel. Maybe you grew up a Mormon. You may have a deep passion for Mormons to come to Christ. Maybe you grew up Catholic. You want Catholics to come to Christ. Maybe you, you know people that think they have their religion right, but they're dead wrong. It could be any group of people that you have an affinity for. You might be burdened by people in certain life stages, moms or dads or plumbers or lawyers or policemen or your coworkers or teammates, whoever are your people, your people. How did Firefighters for Christ get started? A firefighter wanted to reach Firefighters for Christ. Whomever God has put on your heart in an evangelistic way. See, this passage is highlighting the love of God for us that, that, that causes in us, that generates in us a breaking heart for the lost because we love Jesus and we love them. This is real. This is real life. Paul's first great passion was Christ. His other great passion was to see people saved by Christ. So he preaches Christ to all. It makes me want to ask you, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus? If you were to die today, where would you go? How do you know you have Christ? Have you seen a change in your life? Do you have a love for God? Do you have a heart for other people? Is there a growing holiness in your life? And if you're not a believer, what prevents you from turning your life over to Christ. Maybe it's you don't want to admit that you've been wrong or you don't want to give up your sin or you don't want to have to face your family and friends or any number of of smoke screens we put up. But what keeps you from Christ? You need to repent. That's a command 70 times in the New Testament. Repent or perish. Perish. Do not reject Christ. Be saved from this perverse generation. God has commanded all people to repent. Have you? Have you changed your mind? Have you changed the way you're living? Have you acknowledged that you're a sinner? Have you been willing to renounce your sins? Have you changed your view about God and Christ and yourself and your neighbor? Turn to God and commit to follow his will for your life. Come to the end of yourself. Turn from your sins now. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You may have been at this church for years. You know, in the garden, before the cross, see, Christ was grieved over impending sacrifice to the point of bloody sweat and tears. Christ willingly let himself be accursed for us, cut off from the land of the living for a time so that as he bore our griefs, as he bore our sorrows, bore our sin, that he might make a way for us to be saved, that he might, in this work, bring us to God. Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. If you're lost, experience true saving faith in Christ. Commit your life and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because those who love Jesus love others. Those who know truth share truth. Those who love Jesus love others. Those who know truth share truth. Here are three ways you can apply this. First, express your grief. Express your grief. Don't don't bottle it up. Don't push it down. New hearts want to reach dead hearts. Who is your heart breaking for? 
Who do you lie awake at night thinking about? Because they're not saved. Who's your heart crushed to know they're unregenerate? Who's your heart burdened for? Who's your Israel? Don't forget about unbelievers. In your joy over salvation, in your Romans 8, joy for salvation, don't forget the grief over those who are living in unbelief. I have four people constantly on my mind like that. Express your grief. Pour your heart out to God. Share it with your small group. Pray for them. And number two, engage the lost. Engage the lost. Your heart is broken. What will you do about it? What did Paul do? Paul continued to preach Christ. He preached Christ Christ crucified. He said, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. We need to be those kind of people who say, woe is me if I'm not preaching the gospel. You need to think like this. They are lost. They are, they are in danger. They are, they are kept by Satan to do his will. I need to go on their behalf. To do that, you have to shift your priorities. I mean, what if I was to take a look at your checkbook, even though no one uses those anymore? Bank account, excuse me. Calendar, thoughts. What would they reveal? What priorities would be exposed? When was the last time you gave a witness for Jesus Christ to a friend, a neighbor, an enemy, a stranger? When was the last time you introduced someone to Jesus? And if there is no anguish in your heart for the lost, what what is that telling us? What does it indicate to you? Are, Are you lost? Do you have a worldly mindset? Maybe a lukewarm kind of faith? Maybe a calloused heart? Maybe a heart caught up in the world, the flesh, and the devil? Maybe a heart that doesn't understand the need to evangelize? Maybe you have a distracted heart. Maybe it's sports, or your art class, or your job, or or your difficulties, or or TV programs, or, or music, or fiction. Maybe it's good books you read. You know, some people always have a novel, but it's novel for them to preach the gospel. And I know this, being around people who are feeling a certain way makes you feel that way, happy or sad. Just recently, I received an email from a customer service representative at a company. At the bottom was this quote, which some of you know where this comes from. I love smiling. Smiling is my favorite. But it made me smile. It actually made me smile. A suggestion is contagious. It spurs us on. See, when you get around people burdened for the lost, guess what? You get more burdened for the lost. They rub off on you. So go hang around people like that. Go hang out with Ed Trenner. Make him your best friend. Make Pete Roberts your best friend. Find a person burdened for the lost and become their friend and stick to them like glue and they will rub off on you. Get out of your comfort zone. Growth is painful. We all know that. Grow the nerve of evangelistic zeal. Exercise that muscle. You'll find yourself more passionate about lost souls. Go around your neighborhood. Talk with people. Open your eyes. There are lost people everywhere. Far away and close by. Let me remind you that an understanding of God's providence and sovereignty does not breed passivity. It breeds a passionate desire to give a passionate plea to all who hear to repent and believe the gospel. See, because you love Jesus and them, you tell them their sins will be their ruin. Tell them that Jesus came to die for sinners. Tell them there's no other way. Tell them they're going to hell if they do not radically repent of their sin and trust Christ. Give them the gospel on their deathbed. Do you know that every one of us is on our deathbed? The the deathbed just looks different. We could all be vaporized in five seconds. Give them the gospel on their deathbed before they take their dying breath. Get gripped by the gospel and give it to the God-rejecting. 
Charles Spurgeon said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees, imploring them to say, to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Engage with the gospel. And last, let me just say this. You need to expect a response. You need to expect a response, positive or negative. You need to be ready to rejoice with the angels when a sinner repents. But don't expect people to share your concern for their soul. The people that you are grieved over that are living in unbelief, don't expect them to like what you say. They might push you away. They might mock your attempts. They might express hatred for the very God you love. You know, some people don't seem to care about their soul. One person wrote this, I'm not going to heaven and I don't care. And then there's Alexander Hitchens. You may not have heard of him. He's the son of noted atheist Christopher Hitchens. And here's what he wrote, one of the the saddest things I've ever read. I spent my father's final weeks and days at his bedside and watched him draw his final breath and die. And I can assure you that there was no hint of any sort of conversion. There were people who said, hey, maybe Christopher Hitchens became a believer before he died. And his son says, there was no hint of any sort of conversion. He goes on, in fact, we barely spoke about religion at all except for joint expressions of frustration at the God-botherers who made the rounds in the ICU and other units where dying people could be preyed upon by vulturous Christians. Fellow believers, be ready to be thought a vulture. by those who do not share your love for Christ or your concern for their soul. But do not let that stop you. My prayer is that we would have a passion for the souls of the lost and that we would not squander the great privileges we've been given. I mean, next week we're going to take a look at Israel's great privileges that couldn't do what only God does. But above all, I pray that we would see Christ as beautiful, our only treasure, more beautiful to us than any delight or any rejection. Romans 9 is one of my favorite chapters, and I'm hoping it will become one of yours as well. That it would be fixed in your hearts so that in your remaining time on earth, you would be sharply focused on God's amazing works that you would be awestruck by God's unparalleled, unchanging, unstoppable, unassailable, bulletproof salvation plan, and that you would have a deep passion for lost souls. Let's pray together. Lord, we, we thank you for your grace and your mercy in saving lost souls. Those of us who are saved, Lord, we thank you for saving us. And I pray, Lord, that we would have a passion for the souls of the lost, that we would not squander the great privileges you've given us. And most of all, we would, above all, see Christ as beautiful, as our only treasure. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.